Thanks, Emma. Salutations and shit, guys. How are yous? Um, This is going to be this week, so it's almost Christmas. Not quite yet. Um, Happy holidays. I hope you guys are not driving yourselves absolutely fucking crazy trying to, you know, pull everything together for um, Christmas and such. However, you know, it's that time. It'll it'll be done with soon if you are driving yourself crazy. So uh, starting off, I'd like to congratulate Unicorn and BK for winning the Stress Not NYC giveaway. She is the proud, I guess, recipient. Not I was going to say owner, but she's going to be the proud recipient of a free 60-minute massage. And um, I'm very excited to be able to do that for her, especially with the holidays approaching. Um, let's see. Definitely keep an eye out for uh, the last video in my IGTV series. It's just going to be a wrap-up so far, all six videos, where I um, break down how I plan, if you will, and how I kind of organize all of my trips um, is still on my IGTV on Instagram. So that's either underscore decarry or travel and shit with an underscore at the end. Um, I discuss how I use, um, use Google for all the free stuff and my accommodations, how I choose those food and traveling, Airbnb experiences, wellness, nightlife. And, um, you know, I pull it all together. That last video is coming up soon. So, uh, let's see, that is pretty much all of the housekeeping. Just a reminder to check out, uh, and definitely consider blacking and shop blacking. Shopping with black businesses for the holidays. I last week listed a few different um, places that you guys can buy with. VladimirSaint.com, Just Like a Hero, and It Will Be Okay. ChristinePlatt.com, Anna and Andrew series. And there's also my girl, Nay Marie. She is the editor of Taji Magazine. That's the publication that I write for. She's got a host of really pretty uh, jewelry as well as 84 Gem. That is also a really dope uh, jewelry line. Avid Swim, that is a black-owned swimwear line. And I want to say it's not Allie Cards. Elle. Um, Her name is Elle, and I'm trying to remember what the name of her company is, but she does a ton of really, really cute uh, greeting cards. And she, Absinia.com. You can uh, do Absinia. She does, she doesn't, I want to say it's still an Eps, an Etsy shop, but it may just now be a um, digital storefront. But Obsinia has incredible, incredible jewelry. I've bought a ton of her stuff. Uh, so housekeeping, that's pretty much it. You can go to dcarry.com or travelandshippodcast.com, whichever one of those titles you're going to remember, and check all of that out. So today's episode is going to be a wrap-up of my most recent trip. I'm going to start at the end by saying congratulations to my bestest. Um, one of my best friends, Del Not, just graduated from Murray State University in Kentucky. I'm so excited for her. I'm so proud of her. I am definitely Miss Nigeria to her Jamaica. Um, girl, sister girl, I love you, and I am excited to see what doors this opens for you. My girl is now a social worker. Um, so congratulations again. I had an incredible time out there in Bubblefuck ass Kentucky. It's not Bubblefuck. She lives in like Hopkinsville or something like that. But it's not really much to do out there. So we definitely went to uh, Nashville for the mall. And um, I think we were in Nashville when we went to eat after her, um, what do you call it, the graduation ceremony. And um, we had a really great time. Thank you again to uh, my new friend. Erica for letting me ride back to Nashville and staying at your crib because that really saved me the cost of taking an Uber to the airport and the cost of booking an Airbnb. My flight from uh, Nashville back to JFK was at like 6 a.m., 7 a.m. So it really, really was a huge, huge um, favor of her to do for me. And I really appreciate that. So thank you, Erica. Uh, we, I ended up, I guess you can say, um, auntie duties. So 
so that Dal could go get her nails done. I'm like, sure, I'll supervise baby girl. She has a nine, I almost wanted to say eight. I swear these babies are actually younger than they really are, right? But her daughter is nine. And um, shout out to my little ladybug. She, we, you know, we went to the, the bounce house. So the, we were so close to making it through safely. But baby girl ended up landing wrong, hurt her, um, hurt her ankle. And I, although was very steadfast in not participating in the jumping activities, I did have to go out there and, you know, help my baby off the uh, bouncy house. And, um, you know, she is absolutely fine. It was just, you know, I guess you can say, not a, not a sprain. I don't know if it's considered a sprain. I don't even think it was that bad. But, you know, she landed on her foot wrong. But, um, yeah, watching kids, it's a lot of work. Shout out to all you parents and nannies and babysitters because it ain't for the faint of heart. I just, you got to pay attention. You know what I mean? I don't believe in watching somebody's kid and then not watching them, you know? So you just make sure that they stay in your line of sight all the time and you, look, Miss Dana, I want to show you a trick. And then you, you know, you watch the trick. You support them through being afraid of just like jumping into the bigger pit and all that jazz. So. And then we walked around the mall afterwards, and um, I bought her some stuff, you know. It's because it's bound to happen, you know. You don't see kids for a while, and you just feel so inclined to uh, be that absentee parent or absentee, uh, yeah, I'd say absentee parent where, you know, you ain't seen the nigga in a while, so you just buy him stuff. So um, we had a good time. I had a really, really great time in uh, the Tennessee slash Nashville, uh, not Tennessee, sorry. Well, the Tennessee slash Kentucky, um, part of the trip that was from Thursday to Sunday. So good times with good people and a great friend. Uh, before that, I was in Tel Aviv. So I'm working my way backwards because there's going to be a larger chunk, I guess, that I can, um, discuss about the, Amsterdam end of the trip so in the food aspect of my six piece in a carry-on section of the uh, IGTV series that I was doing I you know will definitely consider where to eat and what the say um, national dishes if you will or if I'm by the coast or if I'm on an island, I'm definitely considering getting seafood, right? Because to me, it's only right. All that being said, I recently went vegan a few weeks ago. I feel like I mentioned it. I'm not certain. It was right before Thanksgiving. Um, I didn't really anticipate missing meat that much. Um, The only thing that I wasn't sure I could give up was crab legs. I Crab legs are my favorite food. Crab legs followed by mac and cheese. Uh, For Thanksgiving, I actually made vegan mac and cheese that after two days of eating it, it wasn't that terrible. So it wasn't, it tasted vegan initially, but once I, you know, acclimated myself with the flavoring of this pseudo cheese, it wasn't that bad. My little brother loved the shit, but he's a guy. Well, he's a grown man, so some people... You know, it's really not hard to please when it comes to food. And some people, you know, it is. And then he could have just try- been trying to be supportive. But um, all that being said, Tel Aviv was so, so, so bomb for being vegan. Tel Aviv actually happens to be one of, well, like, I believe that it is the city that has the highest number of vegans per capita. They are up to close to around over 400,000 vegans in Tel Aviv. There are a number of different reasons why that is the case. For the most part, I'm going to assume that it's for different religious reasons. There are many different, uh, I don't want to say many as if there's like thousands, but I'm sh- there are, the religious demographic is very vast in the area. And um, to my understanding, to what people have been telling me, that that's definitely a strong reason as to why there are so many vegans in that area in particular. For me, that made me so, so, so excited to actually 
like experience the food in this location. So usually food is the last thing I really trouble myself with outside of trying to stick with things that the area is known for. What I don't really like doing is going someplace and then, you know, thinking that I may be, um, how do you put it? Um, like, I don't want to go someplace with an American palate and expect them to make foods that they're unfamil- unfamiliar with um, in a fashion that I am familiar with. I'm making noises here. And expect them to uh, make things that or in a fashion or form that I'm familiar with, if that, ma- if that makes sense. So I don't want to go someplace and ask for, um, say I'm going to an island that's huge on fishing. Like if that's like their primary source of income in the area, I don't want to go someplace and ask for a steak. You know what I mean? Like the chances that what they have on hand is going to be, or if you're going to say, uh, probably better off looking at it in the reverse form, in the reverse fashion. Like you don't go to a burger place looking for a fish sandwich. You know what I mean? I wouldn't want to go to a landlocked location and then, you know, expect um, a huge seafood uh, feast, you know? So I try to be reasonable with what my expectations of the foods in that area are. If they are, um, if I'm in an area where, like, I wasn't expecting to um, find lots of pork, in Tel Aviv. You get what I'm saying? Like you're following me here, right? So all that being said, I was really excited because this is the first time that I was going to an area that I knew I was going to be um, trying so many different foods. Let me start by saying one, it was very easy to make food choices when you've got so many options at your disposal. And I guess I can backtrack again. I did great throughout Europe. I did great throughout the Middle East. I, Although it was a little difficult to find vegan options in the airport, you would think that with the airport being as fucking global as it is, that it would have more of a, an extensive choice, especially considering y'all motherfuckers is charging what you're charging at the airport. Like, you're spending $16 on a fucking turkey and cheese. You know what I'm saying? So if, you, if you're going to spend, if you're going to charge me wild astronomical prices for things, give me fucking options. You know what I mean? Like, I'll spend the $16 on some shit that I know that I really want. All that being said... It was very difficult to find vegan options while going through the different airports. Um, But you just kind of have to go for vegetarian and then go through the list of shit that's on there. Is there cheese? Can I take the cheese off easily? Sure. Um, You know, I think in Amsterdam, the guy barely understood what I was asking at that airport on my way to Tel Aviv. And one of the other thankful... um, cashiers knew what I was saying and then was just like, no, this isn't vegan. But, you know, you find something vegetarian and then you can just not eat the cheese. Like, I'm not, I wasn't doing the vegan thing. I haven't changed my diet for health reasons um, in the most direct uh, sense of it. I just was really doing it for shits and giggles. And, you know, to try to incorporate a better um, diet into my own life. I have a really, really shit eat, um, I have really shit eating habits. Like I'll go home and make boiled eggs or I'll eat a, you know, nine slices of bacon kind of thing just because I don't like cooking. I don't enjoy it. So in order to make things easier for myself, I'll order takeout, I'll order Chinese tacos, love me some fucking tacos, or I will, you know, just eat chips and dip for dinner or something like that just because it's fast, it's easy, and I don't really have much to clean up afterwards. All that being said, it was much easier in Amsterdam and Tel Aviv to find vegan options outside of the airports. Other, um, it was easier there than it was in the States. When I was in, we were at the, the, the mall in Nashville and 
you know, I also realize that it's much easier to be more discerning with your food choices when it's only you. Um, when it was the solo aspect of the travel, I was able to hold off on eating until I found some place that would match what it is I was looking to eat. I found that it was much easier to take longer to make a decision on what to eat than it was when I had my friend and her nine-year-old daughter. So while it was just the two of us in the mall, I also don't ever want to be that friend because this weekend was about her. You know what I mean? This isn't about, hi, my friend is here. Let me accommodate her during like a really important weekend for myself. You get what I'm saying? So there's, and just in the type of person that I am, I just don't really believe in being a burden to people when I don't have to be. So I knew that I was never going to be that person that's like, oh, we can't go here. They don't have, you know, vegan tofu or no, that's that's not, that wasn't uh, something that I was interested in um, proliferating. It just you, you can figure it out. You know, everybody's got some kind of salad. And we went to Chili's. When I tell you, I looked through everything on that fucking menu and it was so difficult to find a lot of places will make it easy for you by putting the little V or the little carrot or some shit to indicate that whatever um, is on the, you know, that item on the menu is vegetarian or vegan friendly. Like they a lot of times will do the little GF or the gluten free and, you know, those kind of things. Some establishments make it very easy for you to uh, differentiate between the items on a menu and to um, distinguish what is going to suit your palate, your needs and your wants for that current moment. This wasn't the fucking case at the motherfucking Chili's. So um, it took me a while, but I ended up finding a vegetarian option. I asked them to take off the cheese. They did not. Scraped it off. Really not a big deal. And um, it was good. I ended up having leftovers, and I was able to eat, you know, some leftovers. Um, I mean, I was able to eat my leftovers the next day while I happily rested around the house watching Christmas movies. Uh, movies. Um I love a good Christmas movie. I especially love a black-ass Christmas movie. So I have been loving that Lifetime has a lot of these older stars coming back and doing Christmas movies. I definitely watched the one with Keisha Knight Pulliam and the one with Romani Malakoff, Romani, the the guy from 40-Year-Old Virgin. He's got one on Netflix. I watched that one. And the dude Quincy from one of y'all shows that you love and this the singer Cat Graham, um... I ended up watching that little uh, my Christmas calendar or Advent Advent calendar or some shit. That was really cute. So check out the Christmas movies, y'all. That was I love this part of the season. It's I love Christmas. But um, that being said, I was doing so well, so well until uh, the day uh, baby girl got hurt at the bounce house. Uh, you know. I was weak, and after, you know, tending to a upset child uh, and after babysitting for, you know, in my mind what was so long, which it really wasn't that long. It's just that I'm not used to being uh, responsible for anyone other than myself and my dog for such an extended period of time. Yeah, I had wings up. Just jump jump to the point. Um, I was weak. I had wings. And they weren't even great. They were just okay. So um, not only did I just break away from that whole vegan thing, I went straight to meat. I didn't take a stop over at vegetarian. I didn't take a stop at pescatarian. I went for the wings. Um, you know, I deserved. It was a rough day. When we went to eat for her graduation dinner, Um, I ended up ordering the shrimp and grits, which I thought you couldn't fuck up. You can. It was more like a soup, like a gumbo. I was not really a fan. Erica girl, sorry I left that shit in your fridge. I hope you've since thrown it out. Um, But the food in that instance, in that area of the travel, it wasn't, I guess you can say, how I normally source my food. I can much more easily choose what I want when it's just myself. That's another perk to solo travel that I will point out that you get to make the decisions that you want to make and you don't have to be influenced by being, um, it doesn't have to be a collaborative event. You don't have to compromise 
um, what you want with what somebody else may want. Not that compromising is, you know, inherently a bad thing or something that we shouldn't, you know, aim for. But if it's just you, you do what the fuck you want to do. So when it was just me, it was way easier. In Tel Aviv, I went to, I want to say at least three different places. Um, Also about Tel Aviv, I didn't do a damn thing. I am generally queen of the most when it comes to vacations. I book all the excursions, all the tours. Not this time. Um, I actually rested. I listened to my body. Jet lag hit the kids something fucking serious. I arrived, I want to say, on Sunday. Um, I was trying to meet the... I ended up putting a house tour on my uh, Instagram. So if you want to see the apartment that I stayed at in... Tel Aviv, definitely check out the gram. It should still be up there. Um, Oh, I also have GoPro footage on, I think it's on the Instagram also. Um, That should be up there, I think. Go see. Um, At some point, I will, you know, pull all the, because I ended up coming home Sunday, then went to work Monday and Tuesday, so... I haven't pulled the extra footage. I know that there's more footage someplace on the GoPro, but it's new. I don't really understand how to fucking work the bitch, so bear with the kid. That being said, the apartment that I was staying in was very centrally located. I was near a ton of shit to do, also near Hockmel Market. So that is a really... um, I guess you can say extensive. It's pretty long, and they've got a bunch of fresh fruits, vegetables, spices, housewares, tons of stuff. So when I first got there, I was trying to hold off until 3 o'clock because that's when my host told me I'd be able to check in. So on the way there, I was was passing a restaurant, so I stopped in, got this really good pasta dish. That was cool. Tried some beers. Uh, Israeli IPAs are okay. They have they weren't necessarily my favorite from my trips, um, but it wasn't terrible. Um, it's really I mean, ooh, there was one. It's called Gems IPA. It was in like an amber bottle. Had like a gold wrapper. That one was good. That one was good. But you know, I don't remember them otherwise being. I had one berry flavored one that wasn't too great, and I ended up buying those from one of the markets in the Hakmel area. Um, so, yeah, the beers were decent. The The Gems IPA was really good. So if you find one of those shits, go for it. Um, I ended up finding really cute restaurants, nice outdoor seating. The weather was pretty decent. It was maybe 60s, low, you know, low 60s, high 50s, give or take. So hoodie, as always, you know, I'll stay with a hoodie. Um, and jacket, and you're straight. However, I didn't do much. All I did was sleep late and then wake up and go fucking eat. Um, The day that I got in, after I I took the train and the bus, and um, the bus is really iffy for me in other places. But what's cool about Tel Aviv, at least, I don't know that it works this way in all of Israel, but their bus stops are marked like the bus stop. Like if you go to your Google Maps, the bus stops are cross streets. So say it's like um, Royal Tenenbaum and then it'll be slash Herkimer. So you're going to be on Royal Tenenbaum Lane or whatever, and then the stop is going to be at the cross street for Herkimer when you get to it or whatever. So that I figured out about halfway into the trip that that's how the bus stops actually work in the area. So... When I tried to ask one of the guys, hey, do you know where this is? Now, mind you, homeboy was on his phone. He's like, oh, I can't see without my glasses. My nigga, you were just on your phone. So you could see your phone, but you can't see my phone. Like, you kind of understand what I'm asking for. You could have just, but neither here nor there, right? Neither here nor there. He was less than useful, but I figured it out. And then what I also do is I'll just update the uh, directions on my phone. And when, like, the walking distance is the same as, like, the distance on the bus kind of thing, I usually just get off and just figure out the walking directions. So I tried to buy some, you know, clothes and shit at a little shop. Eh, nothing really fit. Went to go eat. Homegirl ended up just leaving the uh, Airbnb. She was like, oh, I just left. 
So killed more time, finished my food. It was great. I went, enjoyed the apartment. Every day I slept in. I tried to book a sunrise tour and a trip to the Dead Sea, but due to the weather, they ended up canceling the tour that I booked and they refunded me my money. I was very tempted to book a uh, day trip to Petra, which is in Jordan, a neighboring country, and I just, my body said no. So this trip, I, you know, spent some time reflecting. I spent some time really just trying to enjoy the fact that I was on a vacation. Um, Not everything has to be go, go, go. Part of the human condition is that we need rest. Part of the human condition is that we need food. And I think um, one of the things that I am, I guess you could say, promising myself is that I don't ever get so caught up in trying to have content that I lose what travel actually means to me. And it's that level of enjoyment that I am able to experience when I'm in these new places. And I work every day for a living and I definitely wanted to make sure that when I came home I didn't per se need more time to recuperate from the time off that I had um I was able to rest in uh Nashville in Kentucky when I got there so that was good I you know didn't really push myself more than I needed to there. I didn't have to extend myself. Oh, I did go to my Ladybug's um, piano recital. Uh, so shout out to Baby Girl. She did a great job. And it was really cute to see all the other little kids. Like, you know, everybody has varying degrees of talent. But it was in fucking hour. We were in and out that bitch. That I can do all the time. If you invite me to some shit your kid does, I don't give a fuck if these little niggas are good about it or not good with it. Just don't have me there all fucking day. We were in and out in an hour. It was like 20-something kids played their little songs. Baby girl sang at the end. She was the only one that sang. A little vocal prowess. She did a great job. And we were out. I loved it. That's like that I can do. Um, Shout out to parents that end up sitting through all the longer situations and, again, through varying degrees and levels of skill. Um. God bless y'all. So I decided against doing any other little walking tours and like, you know, food market tours and all that other kind of stuff because nothing really jumped out at me except for one. So if you're in Tel Aviv, I want to suggest that if you're looking for a hostel, possibly stay at Abraham's Hostel only because they have, even if you don't stay at the hostel, they have a ton of activities activities available to just about everybody so the tour that I did book and that ended up being canceled was a sunrise tour that included a stop someplace else I wasn't familiar with what the names of the places were so I'm not going to try to you know say them because I can't tell you what the fuck they were but it did include a stop at the Dead Sea considering the weather wasn't that great the high was only like 65 or some shit like that I only needed like an hour or two at the Dead Sea I didn't even need all of that time I just wanted to be able to put on my bathing suit get in there and experience it, even though it's going to be cold. All that being said, the hostel, Abraham's Hostel or whatever it was, but that tour company that was offering it, because the tour itself was unguided, essentially, you just had a uh, tour bus that was bringing you to the locations. So you didn't have someone there to explain to you what was going on, what you were seeing, and, you know, information about the uh, destination that you were at. But the booking with that Abraham's Hostel company or whatever, they had, um, they gave you access to an app that gave you, like, a digital uh, tour guide. So what I was going to scheme was just, you know, downloading the app and paying less to do the tour with another company and then just using the app, but I ended up not going anyway. So none of that was necessarily necessary. That aside, I ended up um, finding a tour that they have that I believe is only available on Thursdays. And that tour is basically focusing on the different refugees in the area their foods that they bought with them from their country, a lot of their stories, 
um, their small businesses that they owned in um, the Tel Aviv area. And that was just like, yo, this is up my alley. People, culture, food, I'm with the shits. But it wasn't being offered while I was there. So I was quite heartbroken about that. But, you know, I tried still not to, you know, in the spirit of, um, oh, how do you pronounce her name? Sophia? Uh, Shifa. Sorry, boo. Um, in the spirit of Shifa, I tried really just not to let that, um, you know, bring down the trip. So I still was able to enjoy my time in Tel Aviv. Um, I got a new tattoo. So if you're watching the video on, um, I guess, what's this on Instagram? Which way is the top? I can't even tell which way is the top. Um, So you guys can uh, see the tattoo. I love it. My um, half sleeve is pretty much complete. I just got, you know, space up here to fill in a little bit of this here. I think I can put something here. Where is it going? I don't know. I'll figure it out. But this is healing up okay. It's doing that peeling gross thing now. But surprisingly, the shit didn't hurt. I was expecting um, so much more pain. Very pleased that it didn't. Um, tattoo guy was wild cool. Really cool dude. Um, I went to Tattooism in Tel Aviv and uh, did a good job. Um, they had Kendrick Lamar playing the whole time I was there. Great vibe for me personally. Thankfully, I was there on a day that the office manager in particular that was in control of the music liked shit that I liked. So... Um, I think that's pretty much it about Tel Aviv. I ended up getting this really cool uh, unicorn sticker. That's my grandpa's dog tag down there. But this unicorn uh, sticker came from the place where I got the bombest uh, fucking vegan burger. I don't know if it was a veggie burger. I feel like it might have been like a quinoa patty or some shit like that. Now that shit was so fucking good. Like that shit was on Instagram as too as well. I really update the stories a lot more when I'm on trips. So if I'm going someplace, definitely pay attention to the stories. You feel like you're there with me, I think. But um, that, I mean, the food was so, so, so good, y'all. It was so good. Um, So I did the pasta the first night. I ended up doing the veggie burger the other night. Then what did I do the last night? I went to those two places. Oh, and then on, I want to say it was the last, yeah, right before I got the tattoo, I ended up going to this really cutesy um, vegan spot, um, and I got, there was soup that I ordered and something else. The shit was good. And she did a really good job of upselling me because after I finished my meal, I had a drink, of course, and I ended up getting, like, tea. Um, She's like, would you like anything hot or sweet before you leave? And I'm like, well, actually, girl, maybe I could go for a tea. And so it's just, you know, it it was just a really nice, um, it was a nice vibe, nice setting. It was was cool. I um, definitely enjoyed that. So before I went to um, Tel Aviv, I spent the day in Amsterdam. So, um... I didn't book anything there either. I showed up, stayed at a hostel. I think it was like Central Amsterdam Hostel or Amsterdam Central Hostel. It's it's in the middle of fucking everything, y'all. In the middle of everything. Um, Again, I took the train from the airport straight there. (coughs) Pardon. Um, It was a really um, easy airport. Oh, looping back to Tel Aviv for a quick second. So... Them trains are fancy as fuck. There's that on that. But I was on my way out of Tel Aviv, and it was, uh, I want to say, a day or so after um, Miss Universe was crowned. And I'm waiting online to buy my ticket to board the um, the train, and the woman at the, the counter is speaking in Hebrew, but she's like, you know, really upbeat and excited and I'm just like shalom but I don't I don't know what you're saying girl 
And so then she was saying, your 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 face, your 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 so you look uh, your face. And then the guy, and she was saying again, when she she repeated herself in Hebrew, and the guy was saying like a queen, queen. And I'm just like, oh yeah, you look like a queen. Your face, you have the face of a queen. And I'm like, oh, well okay, sis. Look at you, Miss Universe. You doing it for us already. Like representation really matters, and it matters because people that not to say that there aren't black women in Tel Aviv because. They're there. I've seen a few of them. But when black women are showcased and put in these positions and on these platforms in a sense that many people across the world aren't used to seeing them in, it opens up opportunities or it opens up um, a frame of mind for people that don't necessarily get to see the beauty in our culture the way that we do. I love being black. I'm black as hell and it won't be anything else. I see the beauty in my skin and I see the beauty in my heritage, but a lot of other people don't for plenty of other reasons. History. We, we understand that. But when these national and, um, I don't want to say universal, but what's the word I'm looking for? But when these uh, global platforms such as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Miss Universe, Miss World, Miss USA, Miss all of the uh, all the different, you know, big things where people from all of these different places around the world can see. And it's kind of like that um, silent cosign, like um, – when your favorite rapper says, oh, check out my artist so-and-so, you check out said artist because, oh, if this person says they're good, they're probably good. When someone whose opinion you value, um, in a lot of cases, media is the opinion that a lot of people, you know, value. A lot of people are told what to like. Let's, let's be honest. So when the new norm, when the new standard, when the bar gets raised to include people that they're not used to seeing and they're not used to appreciating as beautiful or voices they're not used to hearing as being important or they're not used to considering as insightful or knowledgeable or worthy, it it just opens up such possibilities for people around the world to um, include black women in the narrative of what is known to be worthy, beautiful, sexy, smart, funny, and just so many other like incredible things that aren't negative stereotypes and um, negative connotations. So I uh, was... You're always flattered when somebody, you know... Well, it's not always because some people try underhanded comments. You're pretty for a black girl or, oh, you're pretty for a natural girl. Or, yeah, I I love seeing you natural sisters. I can't stand girls wearing wigs. Not over here. Sis wants to wear a wig. Sis can wear a wig. Sis wants to wear a weave. She can wear a weave. I don't give a fuck what anybody else does because the same choices that I have to do with my hair as I please, so do my sisters. So you can – it's not ne- – it's n- – not necessary to demean someone else to uplift another um that aside thank you miss universe for um you know i guess being the new face of yes black women are beautiful um because there are more people in the world that are able to see it now that it is um being displayed on such a large screen, if you will. So um, that being said, me and my little podcast are going to keep going because I think that it's important that black women have voices and that it's important that black women get to tell their story because our stories matter without being sensational, without being, you know, um, dramatic or anything other than what it is we have to say. And um, there was a book that I bought. I'm telling the truth, but I'm lying. And I feel like the um the author of that book really hit home with that message to me. Um, I know it's a struggle that she has with, I think it's bipolar disorder. I'm not 100% certain, but I know that there's a mental health issue that she is basically discussing in the story or in the book. 
because I believe that it's like um, an autobiography or something like that. I say all that to say um, that's where um, the the notion of our stories matter without them having to be um, sensational. Like our voices get to matter as well, you know? So back to, um, so that was the loop back to Tel Aviv. I was in Amsterdam. That's where I was. In Amsterdam, um, again, I didn't book anything. Stayed in the central um, hostel, got off the train, which was very easy. You come out the airport, you follow signs for train, and you, you know, I asked the lady at the desk. Most people were very helpful in Amsterdam. Nobody was real snotty or nothing like that. Um, same with Tel Aviv. I don't remember experiencing. There was maybe two people, but, again, customer service. A lot of times in customer service, that's where you're going to find the assholes. It's not necessarily that uh, you don't necessarily need to take all that personal. You know, I, I feel like the lady was a bitch to the lady that, the, the guy that was in front of me also. But all that doesn't really, inconsequential. So Amsterdam, got off the train, walked to the hostel, almost passed it. Thankfully, somebody realized that she's probably looking for the hostel and told me, hey, girl, you passed it. The stairs were steep as fuck, okay? Wild steep. Like, I might as well have been going up a ladder. It, they were it, incredulous. Like, it was wild dangerous. So they definitely made sure to put up on the wall, hey, girl, we're not responsible should you get hurt. Um so little things like that you might want to look into. That's definitely a mobility issue. Like if you, not even something as severe as a handicap or a disability, but if you just got a bad knee or if you know that, you know, you're not really able to carry a lot of weight up, their hostile staff definitely did help with carrying the bags up and down the stairs. So shout out to them for that. Um, but yeah, just it, look into things like that, especially when you're traveling to other countries because um, historically the architecture and the way buildings are designed and the type of people and body frames that they're designed for may be different than what you're used to. So not everything is big, bad, and grandiose like it is in the United States. So um, that was a very fresh reminder, um, yeah, because of the way the buildings there are designed. Um, after I dropped off my shit, I decided to just walk around and explore. I looked up, uh, food there as well. And well, what I actually did was I used the list from Travel Noir. Thank you y'all for comprising, um, a, I guess, a article, if you will, on how to do black owned Am Amsterdam. So that was the majority of the reason why um, I went to Amsterdam. No, I did not go out there to smoke my brains out because I'm a solo traveler. It just doesn't behoove me to go, um, you know, overseas and get blazed out of my mind and travel by myself. Doesn't doesn't seem smart, you know? So wasn't, uh, wasn't why I went. I went for black-owned Amsterdam. Sadly, I arrived too late to do a I believe it was a free tour, or even if I would have paid for it, it didn't really matter. There are two tours that I was able to find that allow you to um, visit different locations in Amsterdam, Amsterdam that have um, significance in black history. Uh, as many of you know, that is something that I love experiencing when I travel. I love, love, love um looking into the, into the diaspora um, around the world. Uh, blackness abroad is a favorite topic of mine. Sadly, uh, the two tours that I was able to find both started at like 1 and then like 2 o'clock respectively, and my flight landed at 1 o'clock. So I wasn't able to make either of those. Um, I tried to look through the places that they were noting that they were going to visit, and I found a couple of them, like, on different websites, but it just didn't um, work out for me to try to visit all the locations. But on the list of um, ways to do uh, Black-owned Amsterdam, I did find that one of the restaurants that was highlighted was a 45-minute walk away. So the weather was nice. It was high 50, 60 degrees here as well. And I decided to walk 45 minutes from my hostel to the restaurant. And the name of the restaurant is Labyrinth. They are, like, the owner and proprietor, Sam, 
mad cool. Such a, such a kind spirit. Made me feel very welcomed. And he's a mixologist, y'all. The drink menu is like nine pages long. They're so good. Like the there's prose and poetry in the drink menu, y'all. I mean, it's just a well constructed menu, well thought out. And when I tell you the vegan options, vegetarian options were just as plentiful as just your regular um, meat options. Um, it like I was touch and go about going that far away from the hostel because there's always in my mind I got to get back. I don't, I'll walk two hours to get someplace, but then that means I got to walk the same two hours to get back. So a lot of times, even though it, it on the front end, it seems like funny games, but then I try to remind myself that I got to find my way back. But the vent, the menu that I looked at when I looked it up, I said, this is not just up my alley. It is the alley. So I went with, without hesitation and I'm very pleased that I did thank you again to Sam to um you know the rest of his staff that was there they were so kind and shout out to I don't remember her name uh Alyssa or Tessa or but um a white woman very kind I believe she was a partner to the owner I'm not certain she gave me the heads up I was telling her that I was going to Tel Aviv the next day and she warned me there they ask a lot of questions at the airport there, uh, customs, if you will, uh, especially, according to her, uh, of American women and solo travelers. So I was like, okay, yeah, cool. Thank you for the heads up. Th- oh, they do. I have never gone through a more difficult airport experience than I did in motherfucking Tel Aviv. So, y'all, first of all, you give sure I gave this little girl my passport. So she thumbs through it a few times, and then she holds on to it, and she asks me about almost all the destination, all the stamps. If I've been to 22 countries, this hoe asked me about 18. When did you go to Qatar? Who did you go with? Where did you stay while you were there? How long were you there? What did you Did you bring anything back? When did you go to Thailand? How long were you there? Where did you stay? Who did you go with? Did you pack your own bags while you were there? What did you do? Why did you go there? Was it was it for work? Was it for vacation? She asked so many questions about so many different destinations and it not only it it, it was not only like annoying and intrusive. It's like this just this is I, I don't fucking know what I did last week. Why do why do you expect that I remember when the fuck I went someplace five years ago? Nothing. My passport is longer than three years ago. That's what made it easy for me because I could easily just say, um, last year or two. So that for that in that sense, that was an easy out for me. But if she was anticipating me to say it was October two thousand and seventeen, I can't. I don't operate that way. That's not how my mind works. Um, I don't retain dates and the such. But um, so many questions. So I was there for a smooth four minutes. Like four minutes is a long time to be answering questions about, you know, travel. And it, it's, it was fucking wild. It was ridiculous. After that, wait on this ridiculously long queue. This girl collects your passport, walks to a different destination, and then comes and brings your shit back. I don't know what the fuck that was about. But again, I felt wildly uncomfortable relinquishing my passport to anyone other than, say, like, my mom that's coming with me on a trip or my homegirl, like, hey, girl, hold my bag and my shit. I'm going to go run to the bathroom or something like that. You know what I mean? But it's like you don't have, like, a choice. So after you wait on this long line, I mean, you get your passport back within, like, 47 seconds. She just walks someplace else. I don't know what the fuck she does with it, but she's writing some shit down on a little clipboard and she goes away and she comes back. After waiting on this line, this is, which is ridiculous, they basically unpack your fucking suitcase. They swab that bitch down with their little swab thing. So they swab all the out. You take all the electronics out of everything, like chargers, cords, all of it the fuck comes out. You take all that, puts it in a bin. Your... I think you leave, yeah, I'm pretty sure we left our shoes on. Uh, Like, then they open your suitcase, they lift shit out of your suitcase, they swab all the 
the outside, the inside panels of your suitcase, all the bags. They swab some of your clothes. They do the same thing with, like, they, it. I was there for maybe 10 minutes with this motherfucker swabbing shit and taking things out and moving things and one bin to another bin. And then they go and they put the little swab thing, the little test machine, and they wait for the results from that. Then they come back and they swab some fucking more. It, it's so... So intrusive, it's annoying, it's time consuming. If you're going through Tel Aviv, have a long, like if it's just a layover, an hour layover is not the fuck enough. That's some place where you want a three hour layover so that you can pad the shit, depending on whether or not you're traveling during a a high season, a low season, I don't fucking know. But the last thing you want to do is be stuck someplace, and God forbid you catch an attitude and then they pull you to the side and now they're just keeping you there to ask more questions. I've never been more annoyed with a uh, customs process than I have been at Tel Aviv. But, again, this is a country that has dealt with terrorism and internal conflict for years, for years. And my dad was very, like, he's huge on history. And we were having this conversation when I came back. He's like, all of this shit that we're doing now is new to us. This is all post 9-11. They've been dealing with this shit since, like, the 50s or some shit. So security is their thing. This is what they are used to because, sadly, this is the these are the times that they live in, and they've been living in these times for a long time, and they don't, they don't take that shit lightly. So as annoying as it was and as, you know, um, off-putting as it was, you got to appreciate that they're doing what they can to keep everyone safe, that they're doing what they can to take these safety measures um, into account in order for everything to run as smoothly as possible. Back to Amsterdam again. So um, walked around, didn't really see too much. Um, I didn't buy much of anything on this trip at all. Um, like nothing, literally. I think I bought a friend of mine, um, I don't know, a keychain or, no, I bought, a uh, Dell and her daughter stuff from Tel Aviv. That's it. There was really nothing. I think I bought a friend of mine, like a grinder or some shit. But, um, I did, however, yeah, and I mentioned this on my, um, IG, I did visit a window girl. So window girls are the prostitutes in the red light district. After I ate, that was my next stop. So the food in Labyrinth, wild good. Thank you again to Sam and company out there. If you're in Amsterdam, definitely go visit them. It's a real um, real cool vibe in the place as well, and the food is just, like, ridiculous good, right? So I spent my good euro, y'all. Spent my good fucking euro. Cost me about $60 for 15 fucking minutes. I felt like such a journalist. You know what I mean? You're paying for the, you know, you're doing what you can to get the story, to get the inside scoop. Sadly, you can't record shit. You can't do visual recording. You can't do any audio recording. Um, Honestly, homegirl thought I was going to break out a pen and paper, but, like, I definitely showed her on my phone, like, hey, girl, I respect your hustle. I respect what you're doing. I wouldn't want to put your livelihood in jeopardy. I'm not recording anything. I wasn't underhanded or sneaky and doing any, you know, audio recording because respect. Um, that being said, I did take some notes. So I'm going to run through this with you, and then we're out of here. So her name is Julia. She is 34, and she is from Spain. Um, so ooh, I don't know how to make this font bigger. Is this how you do it? Ugh. I can't pull it closer because it's going to fuck up the thing. Um, so she does go home every few weeks. I, th- I feel like she said she goes home like every two weeks or s- um, not two weeks, every like two months or so. And um, she's divorced. She has a daughter and she's basically prostituting to make money for her future. She comes from um, a very poor family and she really wanted like, sh- according to her, she's doing this to provide a better life for her daughter. Um, in Amsterdam, everything about prostitution is legal. Everyone can choose. It's all consensual. She was very certain to stress that she can say yes, she can say no. She does not have to do anything with anyone that she does not want to do. If she doesn't like someone's face, 
she doesn't have to, you know, consent to being with them or not. Um, uh, let's see. They're, the worker has the opportunity to say yes or no, as well as the customer. They can definitely say yes or no. Um, there is an alarm in the room, so she does feel safe. Um, and she's only had to call the police two times. Um, and they're there usually in two to three minutes, and someone from their main office will also show up as well. She did say that the one time that she did, one of the times that she had to call the police, it was not necessarily something that was um, like a scary situation, if you will. It was more so a misunderstanding. She said the customer was very drunk and that there was a language barrier. They wanted sex for 50 euros, and that's not the price. Um, so it wasn't a problem per se. She said that it was just a communication, that she can say yes and that she can say no um, for whatever reason that she may like. For the most part, the issues that she does run into are when people lie, when they uh, try to cheat them, or when they're too drunk, and those are like lying, cheating, and being too drunk. Those are the problems that she has with um, clients when they come in. Uh, speaking of clients when they come in, the base price is 300 euros, which is 335 American ass dollars. Um, and that is, oh no, so yeah, 300 euros for sex, and it's 50 euros for 15 minutes. Uh, a lot of people go in just out of curiosity. She said a lot, a lot of people just come in to say that this is something that they've done because, yes, it is a bit ex expensive, but, um, you know, vacation people do things um she said she also does things like offer massages with happy endings that not every visit with a person a client is necessarily about sex a lot of like she's done interviews before and she's also just you know sat and you know not done anything with people uh let's see she's been doing it for about a year and she this is her full-time job so there are different ships different shifts there's like a 10 a.m to 7 30 shift and then there's like a 7 30 well like I guess um 7 30 or 8 o'clock or whatever till um I think five o'clock in the morning she mentioned or something like that that part I didn't write down but I know that it's 10 to 7 30 that's the day shift and you make your own uh make your own hours they do pay a tip out so they pay to rent the room or they have like a standing room. So when they pay to rent the room, that's when they pay to tip out. And that if you're in the day shift, it can be from like $110 to the night shift where it is about $200. They also pay 20% and 21% in tax. They have to pay health insurance. So for the most part, she definitely expressed that she had a lot of shit to pay just in order to do this job. So I was trying to do the numbers earlier and I was talking about it with Shatik and I was like, yo, so she's got to sleep with like three dudes just to make a thousand dollars. Right. So it's $200 for her rent for the day. And then let's just assume that health insurance is included. So if she's doing like the standard sex worker, um, health screening, that's like every 14 days you do, um, what do you call it? You do uh, a STD panel. And that's like 100, I think in the States it's like $175, $200 or some shit like that. And if she's doing that every 14 days, that's about twice a month. So, and then she has to pay 21% on, in taxes, which I'm assuming is on her earnings. So it's, let's just say on the day that she what do you call it, has to pay for the health insurance as well, that's already $400 off the top because she's had to pay for the insurance. And that, the insurance is a little bit rounding up. I don't know exactly what that number was. But your nighttime tip out in the insurance, it's already $400 fucking dollars. That's already, like, you're fucked for free for once. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't know if I could be um, – I just like on the books hoeing like I just feel like there's so much overhead now granted a lot of protections you know what I mean you got that alarm button that you press your main office can come through the police are there two to three minutes and Shad did make a point where 
the 21% is if you're paying on your earnings, that's um, still $300 an hour. And if, but then it's just like, how do you know if you get like three people a night? What if you there all fucking night and you don't find anybody that, you know what I mean? Like has a face that you could see yourself dealing with for an hour. It just seems like a lot. So back to the notes. Um, yeah, she definitely implied that there was a lot of overhead that was really annoying to to pay for. And doing the numbers, it just, y'all, money, different ways. Um, but still, if you get in $300 an hour, $335, but 300 euros per dick you got to spend, I mean, if you have a good night, that's some pretty decent money just for the night. You know what I mean? You could easily make over $1,000 a day. Let's just be clear. $1,000 a day, y'all. $1,000 a day. It can happen. Um, so, Godspeed to y'all. Be safe. What was the other thing? Um, one of the funniest things that she said that she's experienced is, you know, men dressed as women that come in to um, see her. And she noted that people come to her for her face. She is, like, she's honestly built like a small child. Now, well, let me say this. It was very difficult to figure out how to, like, when you see them in the window, you just go walk up to that window, and then they open. It's The window is a glass door. And so they opened the door right then and there. I was thinking that you had to go through, like, you know, a a main office or something, and that you paid, like, at a cashier and then went to the room with the girl. No, you walk right into the room with that girl, and she closes the, you know, you close the curtain, and it's, like, the window that you see her in is actually a door, and you just, she opens the door, you walk in, and boom, you're there. So um, she wasn't like, she was just the first person that I figured out. She was the first person that I ran into when I'd figured out that that's how it worked. So I don't know if anybody else has different prices, but she said that that's the standard price of the 300 uh, euros for an hour. And um, I honestly can say I didn't see, I think I went, I was there, but I was back to the hostel, I want to say by like nine o'clock. So I wasn't out there that late. I didn't want to be out there when it got too crazy or whatever. And plus, I was fucking tired. Um, but I didn't see many women of color. I think I saw one girl that might have been mixed. Uh, she was very light, and but she did have box braids. Um, other than that, they were all like white girls. Most of them looked like, it was kind of hard to tell with white girls. Sorry, white people. Um, you know, sometimes they look a lot older and then... You know, sometimes you can look in their face and see that they're young, but then they just look older. It, it's really hard to tell. For me personally, I can't ever really tell how old um, white people are. But she, like, was very tiny, very, very tiny. She's smaller than me. She's very, very much so smaller than me. And that was her point in that people come to her for her face. I'd say she was probably like a C or a D cup. Like she didn't have like huge boobs. So she didn't have like, and she might have had smaller boobs. I don't, I, that's not why I was there to talk to her. Um, everybody loves a good set. But like I didn't notice that to really be um, her. She was very, very skinny. Um, and, you know, that was her point. She's like, I didn't have like a lot of cosmetic surgery. I didn't have a lot of work done. Like when people come to me, they come to me for my face. Like she's very pretty. Um, well, she was pretty enough. I, well, she's not bad looking, but she was pretty, right? Um, so she definitely made notes of that. And she, like when we were talking, I was asking her like, well, what are you, what are your dreams? Like honestly, like this is, according to her, not something she's intending to do for the long term. She was doing it just to provide, you know, stack her money up and then get out. You know, that's what all the girls say. I'm going to make my money and then get out the game. Um, her dream goal is to just live a normal life, whatever normal may be to her, and to own a small business. So I asked her, well, what kind of small business? Does she, you know, aesthetics and things. Like she wants to do hair and makeup, 
and, you know, wants to make people, you know, look pretty. Um, so in order to get there, she's basically, you know, working there no more than six days a week. That's you can't work longer than that. Um, you can, however, work on or off your period. That is your decision. And you get 40 days and a holiday. So if you've got a five day work week, Monday through Friday, that's about eight weeks off. And then all the holidays that they have out there. Uh, like if you don't want to work on the holiday, like you don't have to apparently. And she was definitely saying that nobody forces you to work. You don't have to work when you don't want to work. If you do have a standing room, like if you have a room that you just that's yours all the time, even if you don't come in, however, you still have to pay for the room for that day. Um, so she said, if you have a fixed room, you pay when you're out. Otherwise, you don't pay that. But it to mind like that was the little part of contention for me where it's just like okay so why does it matter how many days off you get I guess like there's she didn't really get into what the repercussions were if you went over like 40 or 50 days of vacation I, I like we kind of talked about it but it was just like I got 15 minutes right so I'm not gonna harp on one minuscule detail um on average, she can see three to five people a day. Summertime is, of course, the high period, and wintertime is trash. So um, it can be easy to make your money, and then I guess it could be difficult. When I was there, the streets were packed, 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 packed. But a lot of people are going, and they're just being, you know, voyeurs. They're just looking. They're there to see what's going on, and then you have a certain demographic of the people that are going to go in and actually spend the money because keep in mind, it's three hundred and thirty dollars, three hundred and thirty five dollars, three hundred euro that you're spending to get an hour with this person. So it it's not for just because you're on a holiday or on vacation doesn't necessarily mean you got that much money to spend on an hour. Some people do it, obviously, because here these girls are. Um, and I definitely made sure to ask, does your family know what you do? And she said no that her family does not know, and even though it is legal, culturally, many people do not, still don't accept uh, prostitution, that it's not one of those things that um, women are free to necessarily be proud of doing while they're out there, although it is consensual, and they know it's consensual, and they, you know, have the decision to sleep with or not sleep with whomever they do so choose or choose not to, um, culturally, uh, it's not accepted across, um, the, the region, if you will. So it is still very much so a secret that she keeps from the rest of her family. Um, so I definitely wanted to make sure to, um, include that information since one, I fucking paid for it. And two, I just thought it was, you know, really interesting. Why is my computer frozen? Um, I thought it was just really cool to, um, you know, share that part of the experience. And um, let me see, what was the other part about? Oh, shout out to Dimitri from Best Buy. Thank you for helping me pick out, not pick out, but helping me get my um, GoPro. I told him I was going to shout him out in the next video and the podcast will have to do. So thank you, Dimitri, for your help. Um, if you're in Labyrinth, labyrinth while you're in Amsterdam definitely check that out um, my taxi job I actually took a taxi from the restaurant down to the um uh what do you call it the what's the thing back down to the red light district because I was full like full full big full after my meal and I ended up I didn't want to walk another hour to get to the red light district knowing out district knowing I was gonna have to walk around there and then walk back to the hostel. So I think I spent like twenty dollars on an Uber from uh the restaurant down to uh red light. And um that was pretty much the night. After I got back to the hostel, that's when I met um Shifa and we discussed her being robbed while she was in uh, I want to say Brussels, at the beginning of her really long uh, vacation, she handled it so well. Such an example of, like, just strength and perseverance in the face of adversity is just, like, the go-to, like, you know, there could be, like, a mini travel documentary about her, if you ask me, because I know that I probably would not have been as mature as she was in said situation. 
Um, and then also we discussed a lot about, you know, um, her being a Muslim woman traveling solo, what her family thinks about that. And um, my understanding of what uh, being a, uh, a Muslim person is considering I'm from New York and there's a million different types of people here. I was very candid about my um, understanding of different faiths, even though I have met and interacted with people of different faiths and how, you know, to me being a New Yorker, there's like the view of a black Muslim versus say um, a middle Eastern Muslim. And by middle Eastern, I mean, the stereotypical picture of a Muslim that you think of or you may think of when you hear a Muslim person. You're going to think of an Iraqi or someone from, um, you know, of more of an Arab descent as opposed to this young woman who's from Indonesia, you know? So it was a really great conversation. That was last week's episode. So if you haven't checked that out, definitely check that out. And um, thank you for rocking with the kid. I appreciate y'all. Um, and I am looking forward to seeing you guys, well, not seeing you, but, you know, um, talking to you guys after Christmas. So by the time you hear the next episode, it'll be the day after Christmas. And that means that I'm telling you Merry Christmas this episode. Um, next week it'll be Kwanzaa. So, yeah, I truly hope that you will stay safe. Um, love on your families. I uh, appreciate everyone that you have and, you know, yeah, Merry Christmas. Bye. Sha. Nigga, I'm done. Computer's frozen. <laughs>